Welcome to episode 56 of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. If you're new to the show, Liberty represents the message of all your freedom all the time. And Dad represents the delivery, recognizing tomorrow's conversation with my son is determined by how I engage with him today and then applying it to those around me. I'm your host, DL, and this episode is Use of Force, Stop Killing Citizens, where I'll discuss, well, actually, where Josh Fields is joining me from the Libertarian Apothecary, and we will discuss the issue of police force in light of the various uh, police killings that have been going on in the news today. If you are a regular watcher of the show, then you probably have a good idea where we stand, but if not, no worries, because we're going to get right on into it. How are you, Josh? I'm doing pretty well, Dio. How are you doing today, buddy? Very well. I cannot complain too loudly. <laughs> yeah, too loudly. <laughs> yeah, we can definitely complain. Everybody could. Um, All right. So the issue of police force is yet again in the news, and lively debates are happening as to whether or not the police are using excessive force and whether suspects effectively or outright deserved it. In this episode, we're going to talk about a few of the stories. We're not going to walk necessarily all the way through them blow by blow. You can go and find some other podcast for those kind of things. We would rather use the time that you've given us to kind of address some of the responses that we've seen on the internet and talk about just the issue of police use of force in general. So the first thing that many people might ask is, what credentials do you have to criticize the police? And one of the things that I want to point out is that, you know, people often suggest that since I was never a police officer, I'm not in a position to criticize their job. But I say that's garbage because it's not something that people even are remotely consistent with. It's almost always an argument used to silence critics on a given issue. Josh, is that your experience as well? Yeah, I, I do not like the appeal to authority argument at all. At all. It's, you know, you got to have substance. If you know the material, you know the material, whatever it is. So, right. Yeah. Now, not I will say this. Not belong to one group of people. Right. Now, I will say this, folks. There is a certain level of experience and expertise that should be considered. If somebody is a 20-year veteran of the police force and they have actually interacted with people on the street, who have fled, who have fought back, who have done all manner of different unpredictable things, then yes, there is a certain level of experience that they have that I don't have because I haven't done that. I haven't experienced it. It's the same as if somebody says, oh man, I would totally do this in this situation. I would totally run into a burning building to save you know, somebody's Fluffy the kitty cat. Maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. Unless you've been in that situation, it's a little difficult in some ways to say whether or not you would actually do something or not do something. So I do want to keep that in mind as we discuss. But the big reason that I say that this appeal to authority is not it is kind of garbage is because we the citizens and Josh and I were talking about this before the show. We the citizens are responsible for electing our leaders, which then appoint people. And part of that appointment, in a sense, is the police force. We elect the people, like the sheriff in many places, that is responsible for governing the police force. We also, the people, are responsible for the laws that get put into place. And the police force, they are responsible for enforcing the laws, which also means that they are responsible for adhering to whatever laws are governing them in the process of doing that. So from my perspective, we the citizens have every right to criticize them. That doesn't mean that we'll always get it right, but that doesn't mean that we're going to get it wrong necessarily either because we can say, look, we don't like this. Fix it. Figure it out. Right? And that's that's part of the government that we have established. So I think off the off the cuff at the very beginning, we need to remember that that mm -hmm. we can tell the police we don't like how you're doing things. Find something different. Find a different way to do this, right? Um, and I think that leads probably into our very first part of this conversation. 
which one of the things that Josh and I were discussing right before the show, a lot of these laws, if they weren't on the books in the first place, they wouldn't be there to be enforced. And whatever negative outcome that has happened because of enforcing them wouldn't have happened. It's very similar to people who say, well, if this person had just complied, if they just obeyed, if they had just done this, then this wouldn't happen. And what they're saying is, if this particular thing happened, then a chain of events after would not have happened. Well, all right. If certain laws weren't on the books, then a series of events afterward because of those laws would also not have happened. such as the drug war, which accounts for a great number of all of the, or I don't wanna say all, a great number of arrests that occur, a great number of violence that occurs from the state. The drug war is responsible for much of the militarization of the police. When you talk to people, you know, they're really, really concerned about drugs here and there and everywhere, you know, at our schools, you know, down the block, uh, what about the person down the street that's ruining his family because he's a big drug addict? These are all certainly problems, but the question is, are they problems that require the police? So let's talk about a couple of these issues here. So f I, I think that, um, uh, Josh, do you have any particular uh, scenarios that you want to get to first, or do you want me to kind of lead the way? Uh, you, you can lead the way. Uh, you, you've got some really good scenarios here for us to talk about. Okay. Okay. Let me pull one of these up. Um, so I do, you know what, let me tell you what, let me back up a little bit. Let me, let me, let me, um, I know that I don't like to do this whole authority thing, but I do want to put a little context into where, where my thoughts come from, because people have different thoughts. All, everybody's experience plays a role in how they look at certain things. Right. So if you are a person and this is I'm speaking from observation here, if you're a black person, a black American who has had several run ins with the police and they've been negative, then that's going to shape how you feel about the police force. If you're a white American and you haven't had any negative run ins with the police, maybe no run ins whatsoever, not even a speeding ticket, that's also going to play a role in how you view the policing in America. One of the things that influences me is that even though I was never a police officer, I was part of a peacekeeping force in Bosnia with the U U.S. Army. This was back in 2002. So I want to point out something because I'm heavily critical of the police. Despite being in a foreign country known to have about, I don't know, 9 million landmines at the time, and despite going on multiple potentially dangerous missions, including searching a cave that was suspected of having a weapons cache and patrolling for sex traffickers with Interpol um, and other, um, other international uh, organizations along the Danube River, which resulted in one full-on chase through the city. And despite an almost gate breach where weapons were drawn that I was involved in, and despite even going door to door asking people if they had weapons to turn in. And lastly, despite conducting hundreds of physical searches, not once did, did myself or any of my fellow soldiers injure or kill anyone unnecessarily. No one was killed at all. I don't believe that anyone was killed unnecessarily, or I'm sorry, injured unnecessarily. I don't know if there were any intentional injuries, you know, grabbing somebody, taking them to the ground, so on and so forth. I'm not particularly familiar if any of those happened, but I, I, I am for certain that nobody was injured or killed unnecessarily. And it was dangerous for sure, but I still had to conduct myself with a certain level of professionalism unless I wanted to potentially find myself Fort Leavenworth. You know, so when I, when I think of things like this, I, I go back to the training that I received and part of that training was that we uh, we had spent about six months going to a couple different bases and we played out a number of scenarios. And these scenarios helped kind of train us to recognize um, 
the volatility and the the very quickness with which events can happen, which with, with things how things play out in a particular scenario. So as you're listening to me, you know, because I'm going to be pretty critical of the police in some areas. In some in some areas, I'm going to say, you know what? I'm I'm going to look at the police and I'm going to say this was justified. But in, in many of the areas, I'm going to say it wasn't justified. Um, so this is the background that I'm coming with. Uh, I don't know if Josh has a similar background. Uh, if he doesn't, that's not a big deal because again, every citizen has the, in my opinion, they have the duty to be vigilant of their government and say, look, I like that or I don't like that. And when everybody collectively adds their voice, then we can, we can decipher the, the sheer number of voices and work out the best that we can offer. So, so that's kind of where I, you know, I kind of want to point that out as far as where I'm coming from. Okay. So I think that deals with the issue of, of, of authority. So let's start talking about some particular issues. And one of the issues that, um, that I want to talk about is when people say, this person should have just complied. Well, I think that there's a certain level of intellectual, maybe uh, either dishonesty or maybe laziness. I haven't really decided which one. Probably going to go with laziness. But for right now, we'll just kind of leave it in the air. It's one of the two. So let's talk about Adam Toledo. And that's a recent story. And if you haven't heard of Adam Toledo, um, then probably good for you. That means you're probably not paying attention to the news and you're living your life a little bit more stress-free. But let's go over the story here very quickly. 13-year-old boy, he was shot by the Chicago police. Now, a lot of people are claiming that the use of force was justified because the officer had no way of clearly knowing whether Adam was a threat. So here's what happened. Adam, he's 13 years old. He's out and about around two or three in the morning and he's associating with an adult man. I don't know how old the adult man was, but from my understanding, it was a, a full grown adult. There's camera footage of them, it's, it's from a distance, and it shows that one or both of them is firing shots from a distance. I have not dug into the story, so I'm not entirely clear as to who or what they were shooting at, what they were firing at. Were they shooting at a car? Were they shooting in the air? Were they shooting at a person? I'm not entirely familiar. The police manage, they get called, of course. They manage to arrest the adult man. Adam takes off running down an alley. The officer chases him and yells for Adam to stop. After a few moments of chasing, Adam finally does stop. The officer sees a weapon, yells at Adam to drop it, and then to show his hands, Adam does both. While the body cam, or the body cam footage, uh, it, it doesn't clearly show Adam dropping the weapon because what the, the the angle at which he's uh, which he's you, you kind of just see like the weapon over to the left and then you kind of see his hand and then it goes like this and the right side of his body kind of obscures uh, what his hand is doing because he's up next to uh, to a fence, but yeah. then you see him turn around and he's got his hands up and at that moment that's when the officer fires. Mm -hmm. So my critical nature here says, look, it's not unreasonable to expect an officer to recognize the moment a suspect starts to comply and not shoot. When we disregard that expectation, I think what we do is we effectively condemn suspects to death the moment they run or fail to comply. Mm -hmm. And then any demands to comply after that are kind of meaningless. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on this story, Josh? Because I've been doing a lot of talking here. It's time for me to shut up. Uh, no, no, I look, I, let me break it down. Like, I completely agree with what you just said about the, the comply. I mean, what's if you're not going to give someone the opportunity to comply, you might as well just go ahead and, you know, proceed forward with your aggression. Um, and then obviously it'll make people less likely to agree to comply or disarm themselves if they think it's all just a ploy. So. Um, with Adam Toledo, man, that, that, that video, that, that happened quick. Um, it did very you know, quick. It, it happened real quick. And, um, you know, it's easy to, to, to look at these things and like, you know, in today's climate and try to politicize everything, but we have to remember that these are individual human beings that are going through this. So we had, we had a 13 year old 
you know, we can all sit and talk about he shouldn't have been out and he shouldn't have done this, shouldn't have done that. He was out with a firearm. This is true. Right. Um, you know, and that did put him in a situation that led to his death. Um, the law enforcement officer, you know, he got put in a situation and he had to make a judgment call. Did he make the right call, DL? I, it's, it's really easy for me to, um, with as quick as that happened, to pop through that camera and try to find, take my time and find where that gun and when, what moment it dropped and where he was looking. You know, with the lights moving the way they were, I don't know, I don't know exactly what that cop saw in that split second. I'm having a hard time condemning, uh, laying the blame. This is, this is much different than the situation we had with George Floyd. Right. Uh, it's, this is much, I mean, much different. Now it's oh, yeah. very, it's, it's tragic. It's tragic. But for, from a human, human aspect, we also are asking fellow citizens to be put in this situation where they, they supposedly police our streets for safety. Right. Let's just pretend for a moment that's, that's the ultimate case here. So we got this person out here that made a decision in a split moment. You know, was it the wrong one? I, I don't know. But this ties back into what you just said about training and what you was discussing there. You know, what, what, what can we do? How can justice best be served in this? I, I don't know if the best thing we can do and come away feeling decent about this is if we charge the law enforcement officer. Right. I think we need to revisit the training. Um, is there something we can do differently, uh, you know, that can address this? Now, now, that's outside of my bounds. You ask about what people's experiences are. I mean, I, I'm in the Army, but my, my MOS is, I, that's not what I do. Um, you know, and that's completely different than what law enforcement officers have to do. So those, um, so those you're, you're actively in the military. Yeah. I'm in the reserves. I'm a pharmacist oh. though. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So drug dealer in <laughs> private and gotcha. Yeah. Yes. Um, just, just a drug that, dealer all around. Can be a, yeah. You know, right. <laughs> I, you know, I, the rest, rest is no comment. <laughs> I got you. No, but you know that can be a whole other episode. He's a legal drug dealer, feds. Yeah, legal, that's right. Um, you know, e even people within the army or the military, it doesn't mean that they have the specific even type of training that can handle right. those types of events. Like you were saying before, you were deployed, you had to to go through very situational based training. Right. The, the rules of engagement, obviously, we both know this, are are, are very very strict. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there has been times I feel on the battlefield, it has hindered our troops. Um, however, whenever you're talking about um, urban warfare, uh, you have to be absolutely careful, absolutely careful. Right. Um, you know, I, I would uh, if our tactics uh, were used on civilian populations, uh, our domestic tactics were used on civilian populations overseas as our military, you know, where places our military is, it would look terrible. Right. Um, right. So I, I would probably want to see, I mean, I certainly want to see uh, training be addressed. I want people who are not politicized. I want people who are professionals leading this training. I, what I'm saying is I don't want representatives writing training. You know, right. th these are the, these are the algorithms we think our police should follow and do. No, I don't want that. I want people who are trained in uh, good de-escalation uh, de tactics uh, and uh, threat response tactics. And, you know, uh, and, and I want to focus, too, on that de-escalation. Right. And I right. do think that they, there needs to be a standard rules of engagement for domestic law enforcement. Maybe a, uh, a domestic citizen's bill of rights almost. I, I, I don't know to like push back just a little bit more I, I i don't know but there needs to be there needs to be reform on this case so like this this case with uh, uh adam toledo uh that is his first name right yep that's correct adam toledo um so after i said it i was like um <clears throat> adam uh there's a lot of things that need to be looked at at this case um individually but I, i'm not sure that charges need to be brought against this officer i i, I don't gotcha. i don't might maybe lose a job um, but I, I, I'm not sure that this person was willfully intending on taking his life. Right. So, yeah, I think that's a good point to make. There are I think we need to you know, it's very difficult right now because the climate that we're in. Is very emotional. Yeah. And that's what I was trying to say. They're they're human beings, too. Like, right. they're, you know, I mean, this is this is a tragic event for people. 
from observation, not from experience, it's a very emotional situation for many black Americans because yeah. this is kind of their worst fear, right? And maybe not even kind of, but maybe I, I, you know, I'm, I don't want, I want to be careful that I don't speak for an entire group of people, let alone just, you know, even one person, but, um, or I said that backwards, but you know, I don't want to speak for a single person, let alone an entire group of people. But from observation, from having conversations with some of my black friends, one of their big concerns is not only that they'll have a negative interaction with the police, but it will then lead to potentially their death. And then on top of it, the, the, their death will not uh, justice will not be found in their death if it was a wrongful death, right? So it's a very, very real situation that we're dealing with. Yeah. And we want to be careful not to trivialize it. At the same time, we have to recognize that there are people who are bad out there. Or if we want to take a little bit more, um, a little bit less negative perspective of people, we want we could say there are people who make very bad decisions in the moment that put other people in a situation to have to make very tough calls, right? Yeah. And I think we have to start really looking at these cases very individually, and we have to not allow ourselves to say, okay, there is this real thing, whatever you want to call it, whether you want to call it privilege, the blue line, whether you want to call it racism, it doesn't matter what you label it. There is a real thing where the policing has a, 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 a negative an additional negative impact, a uh, uh, higher negative impact on those in the minority uh, that, that are considered minorities, whether they're black or Hispanic or what have you. There is a disproportionate number of people that are being killed. The question is not whether, you know, whether there should be more people that are white that are killed or less people. The question really is, in each particular instance, was that the right call? And there are, just as, just as there are white people who are um, criminals, who create a situation where somebody has to defend themselves or another person with lethal force, uh, lethal, yeah tongue tied, lethal force. There are black Americans, there are Hispanic Americans, there are all sorts of Americans that do the same thing, which means there are going to be times where the police are justified. There are going to be times where they're not justified. And we have to really be careful not to just start lumping them all together because then you're not going to get justice, right? Um, now, I tend to be a little bit more critical because I look at my prior experience and I say we went through trainings such that we knew the cards, the deck was stacked against us. We hated it. As a 22-year-old, uh, which is about how old I was when I went to Bosnia, as a 22-year-old, I hated the idea. We, we kind of made fun of the, the rules of engagement that you just mentioned. And we said, somebody has to practically be shooting at us before we are allowed to even chamber around like we could we weren't even allowed like at one point we went knocking we went door to door knocking saying you know like hey do you have any weapons that you would like to surrender to us now i want to pause here for just a moment if you're watching and you're a libertarian and you're like oh my god dl liberty dad i can't believe you did that shut up i was a conservative then so we went and knocked at the doors and we would just ask them like, hey, do you have any weapons? And if they said yes and gave us a weapon, great, we took it. If they said no, we left. One guy said, yes, I do. You're not getting them. Thank you. Have a nice day. And that was it, right? But here we were uh, in a foreign country asking people after, you know, this was the war was only, a, you know, like a decade prior, uh, the, the horrible war that they had in Bosnia. And here we were going door to door asking people if we could have, their, if they would surrender some weapons and we're not even allowed to have a, a, a round chambered. Like yeah. 
how scary is that right because oh, yeah. i mean somebody pulls a gun on you and says get out of here and shoots at you if you don't have a round chambered you're done you're end done. of story you don't you don't get an option right so to me at the time i hated it now i look back and i say you know what because of those rules of engagement we didn't accidentally shoot people we didn't accidentally use mm. lethal force and i think that is something that's valuable did it suck yes it did it was terrible i yeah. hated it at the time but i look back and i'm like I'm glad because now I'm 42 years old, 20 years later. And you know what? I don't have to live with the fact that I shot somebody that I have to question every single day. Did I make the right call? You know, and there was a time where there was one moment where everybody had their firearms pointed at the ready, you know, safety right there. I mean, just a, a thumbs, you know, flip away from the safety being off and, and this guy being shot, you know? Um, but again, I, I, I attribute the, the lack of killing to the rules of engagement. And I feel like the rules of engagement with the civilian uh, police here in, in, in the US um, are not strict enough, but they also have too many laws. And this is probably the bigger point. They have too many laws that they're trying to enforce and any law that gets enforced, th literally the core of that word enforce is force, which yeah. means at some point a weapon may be used to ensure that somebody's complying. So I think that's what uh, I think. I think those are some of the things that we really need to to include in this conversation. Is we can't just say, "Here's a huge pile of laws, go enforce them and never kill anybody." Yeah, because that no. that's kind of absurd in a way well it, it is it is really absurd and you know it, we have obviously this is a complex problem it's not one that's created by just one thing we've got the training issue uh, we've got the amount of contacts that's going up the war on drugs has amplified law enforcement contacts and obviously mm -hmm. um you know our incarceration rates are just astronomical but you know the overall threat i mean you do have racism in the system. It's very real um, mm -hmm. people out there who engage in that, but the enemy, the, the actual problem is the state itself. And it, it, it just seems like the conversation keeps getting misdirected as right. if it's just one thing. People want to blame this on just one thing. Our, our police, our problem with the police is not just racism. You know, there's a lot of things we have to address. And whenever we just group things in or, um, you know, sometimes it most certainly is. And I'm not trying to trivialize it. And actually, I'm right. trying to do just the opposite. I want this stuff to stop. I mean, you know, it, obviously, I, like when you, when you played Elijah's, when you mentioned his words in your video earlier, uh, earlier this week, you know, that really hit me that I mean, that really, really hit me. You know, you really sit there and think about, you know, is this what, what if this was uh, my son or my daughter, or one of my friends? Uh, or so what if it was not somebody I knew? This is another human being that just right. just suffered, just suffered through this. And, you know, I can't believe that, that case that still there's no, no resolution in it whatsoever. The grand right. jury hasn't come back yet uh, or they just now went out. And this happened quite a while ago, right. you know, relatively right. speaking. We'll get to more on that in a, in a bit. Yeah, sorry. So I wasn't trying to Don't jump, worry. but like, you know, it's no, you're good. You're good. I, I, I'm not, I just want the audience to know, definitely not trying to trivialize what I'm saying, but when you jump to sudden conclusions, you don't look at all the nuance of what was the failure here? Where were all these breakdowns? Now, look, right. society, yes, society, we all need to take a really hard look at ourselves. What are our kids doing? What are our kids? What's a, what's a 13 year old doing out in the middle of the night? Right. Right. Here's the thing. I, that's not a problem the state should fix, not a problem the state should be asked to fix. That is something right. we as a society, as individuals in our communities have to fix. Right. But what we can address is what the state's doing. We look at what the police officer did, the tactics that they use. We scrutinize that. Then we go a little bit deeper. We scrutinize the laws that were used. Mm -hmm. You know, you just you go through every level anew. Right. And look at it. Is this right? Can this be better? Even from 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 unfortunately from Adam's death, there's things we could, we could learn. There's things we can do maybe about pursuit. I, you know, I don't know, like we was saying, like, let's let the professionals handle this. 
right, but let's right. keep them involved in the conversation because this didn't just happen on its own. There were right, factors right. on both the state's end and unfortunately on Adam's end that caused this terrible situation to happen. Right. And if we only focus on one thing, we'll never fix this problem. Right. Now, you and I want to change laws. We do want to do that on top, but we both understand that's a daunting task. That's a daunting task. So how do we affect things quicker? Well, training. That's, that's right. the first thing we can do. But, you know, there's a lot of things. I just want everybody to, it's a big thing. It's a, yeah. There's a lot of people that are, you know, getting the boot of the state. And it's not just because that they happen to be, you know, dark of skin color, you know, right. Duncan Limp. There's a lot of, a lot of people. Um, and we need to stop it for each other, all of us together. As right. Friends. You know, there was an interesting, interesting tweet that I saw from Candace Owens. And uh, she said, you know, I don't remember the exact wording, but she was basically saying like, hey, you know, some people are saying that training is the issue, that we need better training. She said, no, you need to train your children better. And so I kind of tweet to uh, uh, there, <sighs> tongue tied. Yeah, people are going to think that I'm drunk off a half a glass of wine. I swear to God, I'm not. But, um, uh, you know, I, I tweet quoted her and I said, yes and yes yes we do need better police training yes we need to train our children better 13 year olds do not belong out running around with full-grown adults shooting in the streets no. i don't care if they're shooting at an empty building they don't belong doing that yeah this stuff right? doesn't period nobody that. does actually it's technically but 13 year old especially especially doesn't no, it, it, this stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum right you know this there were things that precipitated this event right and as you know your liberty dad I, i'm a dad to you know young kids I, you know I, I look at that and i'm like okay i need to make sure that i'm adding discipline or doing doing all the things and i'm sure adam's mom is horrified and this doesn't mean that she was a bad right. parent she might have done everything right god bless right. her i mean you know everything to the best she could people make stupid mistakes now right Regardless of why he was out there, whatever, did that mean that he deserved to die? Absolutely not. Absolutely. Right. You know, right. as far as I know, he didn't hurt anybody. Yeah. He was acting yeah. careless. But we need to just analyze these situations honestly, you know, and, and talk about the things that we can improve so these things don't happen again. And, and I don't want that to sound like a cliche. Like, right. So th these things never happen. Obviously, as long as humans are involved in some way, there's going to be mistakes. Right. We, we make errors. Yeah. Um, but the, the important thing is, it's not about the fact that we make errors because we're never going to be perfect. It's a question of what do we do after we make that error? Right. How do, you how know do, what? We, how do we reconcile these things? Yeah, that's 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 the hallmark of success. You know, let me um, let me jump off of something that you just said. And uh, I'm trying to collect my thoughts at, in, in kind of real time um, on this matter. But. You know, one of the things that you said you know, one of the things that we talk about is um, what should children be doing? Because a 13-year-old is a child. What should children be doing? Should they be out at two or three in the morning? No, they shouldn't. Should the parents stop them? Yes, they should. And then you said, hey, you know what? I don't know what this mother was doing. You know, maybe she did the best that she could. I agree. Maybe she did. Years ago, I operated or I worked at a church as a youth director, and I have since, you know, left the church. We won't get into that, but I have mentored a few times since then, and I've mentored at-risk children. And one of the things that I noted when I was going through some training, uh, the organization here locally in Jacksonville, Daniel Kids, they required you to go through some training. And one of the things they pointed out was there weren't enough male mentors. So I just kind of want to digress a little bit here. And I want to point out that one, there wasn't enough male mentors, but two, um, a lot of people like to complain after the fact when things have went awry. And the question I have is, where the hell were you when you could have made a difference? Not you, Josh, but just yeah. in general. Um, and and here's, here's my gripe that I'm gonna kind of kind of take that and jump off with. When I was working as a youth director, 
I, I worked with some kids that were from, you know, the wrong side of the tracks, if you will. And this was in Midwest Indiana. So we're not even talking about like a city like Chicago where kids really get mixed up into some really serious stuff, right? We're talking about Midwest Indiana, small town, 40,000 people, you know, somewhere around there. And, you know, they have their bad side of town and the kids that are getting in trouble there, um, very, very few are doing things like you might see in Chicago, but they're still getting in trouble enough, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember there was a particular family, there was a couple of particular families. And I remember one of them, they got a write up in the news and people were throwing a big fit and they were just like, oh, these squatters and all this other stuff. They weren't squatters, they lived in the house. They happened to live in squalor, if we want to continue that line of you know, mm -hmm. rhetoric. Um, but I had trouble finding volunteers to help. And I remember I was working through a church. I remember one particular family felt that their child was too good to be around these bad kids. And I, I get the whole one, you know, one bad apple, blah, blah, blah. Don't get me started. But they, they left. They left the church. Right. Okay. So they weren't even there to help. So it was just me, my ex-wife at the time, uh, and my buddy who was the music minister and his wife. And those were the primary, that was the primary help that I had to work with probably 10 to 15 kids, you know, roughly. Mm -hmm. And um, so scroll forward many, many years. Uh, my, uh, you know, I moved to Charlotte and then I moved now to Florida. My mom had sent me a, a news article from the local town. One of the kids that we had in our group who that we had worked with to, to the best that we could, he went to jail because he had grown up, got a girlfriend, she got pregnant, had a baby, that baby died because it was malnourished. And I'm gonna tell people this because I want, you, I want people watching to hear this and I want you to understand the gravity of years, mistakes years prior, you know, apathy years prior. That baby died and they did an autopsy and they said they found a speck of baby milk in its stomach, a speck, right? Now I look at it and I'm like, you know, the news kind of purported that maybe he might've had some mental issues. That might've been the case from what I remember of him. You know, maybe he um, got himself involved in some things that he shouldn't have early on. They deteriorate his mind, whatever the case may be, right? Like I got it. at the end of the day, I'm like, you are still responsible because yeah. As far as I knew, he was at least capable of understanding that a baby, a baby, and we're talking about an infant, we're talking about a baby that couldn't even walk, needs to eat, right? So everybody, and I read some of the, uh, I read some of the opinions from the local newspaper. People were outraged. I can't believe this. And by the time when word got back to me, I wanted to write in and scold the entire effing community because I remember that guy when he was a child, when he was in um, probably middle school. I don't think I had, uh, I don't think I came, I don't think I interacted with this family until he was about middle school age. So when he was in middle school, I worked with that family. And I had trouble finding volunteers, people that were willing to work with these kids. And so then years later, a decade later, when something terrible, horrible happens, everybody wants to be outraged. And I was like, you know what? He's guilty because he should have known better. But at the same, at the same time, I look at it and I say, so are you. Let me get that finger up in there. You, mm -hmm. if you're not helping, you're part of the problem. And this just this is something that I'm really passionate about. It just burns the hell out of me. Is that people they don't want to have anything to do early on when maybe they could make a difference, but lo and behold, a decade later, they sure want to bitch about it. And that yeah. that just that just gets me. So, you know, yeah, maybe Adam Toledo's mom, maybe she could have done a better job. Maybe, maybe not. I don't really know. But what I do know is were there any mentors in his life? Were there, mm -hmm. were there any men stepping up to say, you know what? This young guy over here, he's got it rough right now. He doesn't have a father figure that's going to help bring him in line. That's going to help 
teach him the proper way to function in society. Let me spend a little bit of time in, you know, a little bit of my own time. And maybe, just maybe, he won't be in jail for something that he doesn't need to be in jail for in 10 years. You know, you know, you know look. Sorry, soapbox no, there, folks. I'm sorry. This I, is something that just gets me. No, I, I appreciate that, uh, D.L., and um, I'm sure the audience does too. You know, there, there's only, especially as as being libertarian, most of our solutions we're talking about are things that are about removing the state from. We're not really trying to solve right. uh, crises, but we, you can't ignore, you, we can't ignore it because culture has become so uh, pervasive in the government. So it's not that I'm saying that I want the state to facilitate these changes and get the state more involved in the family. But, you know, I do I do challenge our listeners to, uh, you know, be involved, especially, I mean, at the very least, like a, a start with your own kids lives. Right. You know, uh, you know, just do a little bit that you don't have to save the world like the whole world. Just what's around you, you know, do your best. Right. I mean, as a dad, it's like how often do I mean? Every dad knows this. Maybe you question: Am I doing the right thing? Am I doing right, this? Right, right. You know, at least I know. Like I'm, I'm, I'm doing the best that I can. You know, I've yep. come across people who they don't spend time with their kids, and they don't, they don't do things with them, and then they wonder as they grow up why they're why they're going in certain directions. So I mean, if we can't always blame, we can't blame the government for all of our problems. You know? Right. And th- this is this has nothing to do with with, with race, uh, where I grew up in similar type problems. We had our little town, that town of 40,000 you talked about. I grew up in a town of 20,000 and I didn't even grow up inside that town. I grew up outside of town. Gotcha. And there was, there, there was the families that were, they lived in squalor and, you know, and I had one guy I went to school with, they had dirt floors. Um, I've talked about this in one of my episodes. I, I grew up in Southern, you know, in Appalachia in Southern Ohio, a lot of good, a lot of great people there, but at the same time, there's people there. They would see a problem. They'd see a kid. They'd see a kid. They'd judge a kid because of their last name, you know. And to me, like for whatever reason you're judging them, whether if it's a last name or the color of their eyes, the color of their skin, or religion, you're judging them by something that's not of their doing, you know. Right. Not that you know. It's it's ridiculous. And um, these people grow up and function in our society, and whenever they commit these atrocities and do these things that just bewilder us, I mean, we act confused. I mean. <laughs> Of course, of course, whenever you start out treating people in society and your communities like that, and then you don't pay attention to them or, or you're just like, oh, that's, that's so-and-so's kid down the road at 2 a.m. You know, that's, that's not my problem. Right. And hey, right. when I grew up, you know, where I grew up, I, I swear to you, Dia, like before I got home, if I was doing something that I shouldn't have been doing in town, riding around, skipping school, my folks knew before I got home. Right. I mean, I mean, granted, I had the luxury of it being a small area and pretty much everybody knowing everybody. But that level of community accountability, like that, that network, not not Karen's, not snitches, where you, where you actually do look out for your fellow human beings, especially right. with our children, you know, with our children. If you're going to cry, you know, and be upset that a 13 year old got shot. But whenever you see a 13 year old rolling down your street you know, at 12 and three o'clock in the morning and you don't say anything, can you really complain? Right. Well, no. and, and not just say anything, be part of be that. Part of it. Yeah. You know, like, like get involved and say, look, I'm going to be a mentor and I'm going to, I'm going to, here's what I like to tell people. If everyone was a mentor, society would be a lot better. And you don't have to be a mentor to 13 year old kids. Maybe you're going to be a mentor. Maybe you're just, maybe you're an accountant and you're like, you know what? I can't stand kids. They get on my nerves. I don't have the patience for it, but I'll work with an adult. I'm going to help an adult out. I'm going to help an adult manage their finances. Mm -hmm. And maybe that adult will be a better parent, right? Because they'll have more money. You know, they'll have better control of their money, whatever the case. I don't know. I don't know how you help. But if every person would find one person that they could mentor, then society would be so much better. You only yeah. got to work with one, just one. There's seven, well, I don't want to say seven billion. There's 320 million Americans. You know, I don't remember exactly how many adults there are. Let's just say there's 100 million adults. Let's just say half of them decide to be mentors to the other half, mm-hmm. right? It's 50 million mentors helping out the other half. I'm sure that those numbers are wildly off base, but the, the point still stands, right? Like. 
we're helping out our fellow Americans. Find a way to mentor with, you know, whether it's a teenager or it's an adult, whether it's teaching somebody some new computer skill or just teaching them not to be a jackass on the street. Yeah. Pardon my language, folks. I didn't give you the warning. Well, hey, it's, 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 that's, that's real though. And you know, that, that's a culture shift. So, you know, like I said, I said on my show in a different episode, what I'm going to do to make that kind of community happen is in my, my niche, my little niche and area, the people I mingle with, that's how I conduct myself with them. That is the standards I set for those around me. You get what I'm saying? Right. So I, I don't have to set standards for everybody. I just, I, I behave, I conduct myself a certain way. You know, and hopefully that'll it'll emanate out. And there's a lot of people like that, but but we we need to need to understand that there really is a culture shift here, and then we need to we need to be working on that. We need to be working right. on it together, and um, instead of focusing on the blame, which obviously in situations like some of them that you've covered, there certainly is blame to go right. on, the state, on the state's end for sure. Uh, but we can't we can't be afraid of talking about these these cultural personal issues that everybody has every right. group of people have that we need to find some ways around all right hey real quick do you need to step away yeah 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 right. so, give me so about i'm 10. gonna i'm gonna pause this for now and then i'm gonna go and i'm empty and that's not good so <laughs> um not to say i'm an alcoholic but i might be hey this is so. a this is actually a pretty tough episode uh, you know you so. really did get me with your 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 power poem so. I, I, I'm not, I'm not joking, bro. That really was. Gotcha. Well, I'm going to play it at the end of this one too. So, I mean, we won't watch it. I'll add it to the end. <laughs> you're going to, you're not going to get me to cry on camera. I, 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 I teared up a little bit because like I, I did. I nice. Oh, I got right, you. man. Give me, give Take me a care of your daughter. I'll be back in a few minutes. All right, bud. Where we were, at, you, you start us off. Yep. Cause I have no, I, I don't know where we were at. All right, folks. So we took a little bit of a break there to go and be dads because that's what we do. We're dads. That's right. Now we're coming back. We did digress a little bit. I kind of went on a small little, little baby rant. It wasn't hey man, the biggest it, one. You get to know me, you'll see a bigger one someday, but that was a, <laughs> a minor rant, if you will. But let's get back on track and let's talk about the use of force by police. So the next story I want to talk about is the Dante Wright case. Dante was pulled over because his vehicle tags had expired, okay? Now, I know some libertarians will take exception to that. Uh, we're not, I, well, I'm not gonna go into that. Maybe Josh will. Um, and then there was some issue about an air freshener on his rear view mirror that apparently was brought up by one of the officers. So I, I didn't know this, but apparently in some states, it's against the law to have things hanging from your rear view mirror. That's really absurd. Okay. I, I, I don't know that there's more to say than Dude, that no. is absurd. No, That's easy. absolutely ridiculous. Um, yeah. But anyway, after running his name, officers had discovered that Dante had an outstanding warrant for failing to appear in court over charges of gun possession and failing to keep in touch with his probation officer. And that was over a charge against him for allegedly assaulting and attempting to rob a woman at gunpoint. Now, the reason I say allegedly is because it was still pending. In other words, somebody had claimed that this had happened and he had not yet been to court to determine whether or not the person making the charge had the evidence to prove that he was guilty. Okay, so we, we do wanna try to remain as neutral as possible when the information is still in pro or when the uh, the case is still in progress. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the picture here already is that Dante, it seems likely that he might have been a bad character. It's hard to imagine that someone tries to flee officers while they're trying to arrest you because you failed to appear in court and keep in contact with your probation officer because there were charges that you violently tried to rob somebody. However, none of those reasons are why he was shot. Officer Potter, a veteran of the police force since 1995, that's like when MTV was playing music, and a field training officer. So she trained officers for the field. She mistakenly grabbed her firearm instead of her taser. 
and I'm pointing to different sides because it is my understanding that the taser is on one side. I don't know which side, but the taser is on one side. The gun is on the other side, and that's on purpose so that you can use the muscle memory. It's my understanding. I could be wrong. So you can find video online where she even yells taser multiple times and then fires, realizes that she just shot him and then exclaims, you know, like, I just shot him. So it's very, very, uh, like, unmistakable, in my opinion, that she shot him when she didn't intend to. Mm. Now, Dante's critics will say, well, you know, if he hadn't tried to resist arrest and he hadn't tried to flee, he'd not be dead. Well, that's true. And it's true that if he had not skipped out on his probation uh, or missed court, his court date, he would probably not be dead because the chain of events wouldn't have happened. And it's also true that if he hadn't tried to allegedly again violently rob a woman in the morning after a party, he probably wouldn't be dead because he wouldn't have had a court date that he would have missed, that he would have got pulled over for, and um, the officers wouldn't have tried to arrest him because he had a warrant out for his arrest, right? So I get it, true. All of that is most likely 100% true. None of that would have happened, right? But again, none of those reasons are why he's dead. Yep. He isn't dead because the officers felt he was endangering their life at the time. He's dead because an officer negligently grabbed a firearm instead of her taser to subdue a fleeing suspect. As I've said before, I'd be more willing to accept an accidental shooting from officers if there weren't so many intentional shootings. Yeah. Josh, give me some thoughts on this. Everything he said is true. It's, this is another complex situation that, you know, butterfly effect. If, you know, if he would have done this, this or that, but that didn't have anything to do with why he lost his life. Now, granted, you got the people out there say if he would have complied. Sure. You know. And I know libertarians don't want to, there's a whole issue with that. You know, right. why he was pulled over. Yeah, we can talk once again, you know, if the laws were changed. Why do we even need to register our cars? You're going to make an issue about the fragrance hanging from the rear view mirror. I mean, yeah, these things are ridiculous. But the one thing we know right off the bat that we can do uh, to focus on is the fact that this was an accidental shooting because of negligence on the cop's part. Right. Um, no, I, I don't know. I know they usually wear them in opposite sides. I don't, I didn't see the video of her, like where she was pulling from, if she had them both on the same side, if she inverted it. Um, I don't know what model, uh, taser she was using, how similar it is. I think mm -hmm. somewhere I saw that it, its model was about a pound difference. Right. That's what I saw. Um, I saw that as well. Um, I, I don't know how Supposedly it was yellow. Now, here's, here, here's, here's one idea I have. Now, look, just, just right off the bat before I dive into it, what I would want to see, this is just me trying to think objectively at the beginning, whatever taser the officers use, it, it should have a different mechanism than their firearm. I think okay? so. It should be discharged differently. Because um, it's, just, it's just like any other industry where you've got a stepwise process before a final product or final action, and you got a system of safety checks. It's like, okay, in pharmacology, pharmacy, we've got, you know, look-alike, sound-alike drugs. You know, we've got different things that we, we look on so it doesn't become like an optical illusion. So if right. the, 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 the guns feel different, not only are they located in different places, are they, are they that distinguishable in your hand that you can identify without looking which right. one you have? And, um, you know, but, but here's the thing, too. It, it's icing on the cake for me with, with, this, with this officer is her length of time. She's been an officer for a long time. So far as I know, it looks like she's got a really good record. Uh, she was, uh, like you said, she was a field training officer. So this is somebody who's supposed to be training these cops, discharging right. an accurate weapon. Now, if this was maybe more of a minor administrative misstep, I probably could chalk it, chalk it up. But this is, uh, this is pretty bad. This is really bad. Right. Uh, not not right. only because it cost a life, obviously, primarily because it cost a life, but but this level of mistake is like one of those tier one mistakes, you know, where it's like, you know, it, you, you forgot to initial your paperwork on the bottom left corner. Mm -hmm. That's not that big of a deal. You've been working for 22 years, whatever. You don't care about it anymore. But right. just discharging the, the, the wrong um, devices. Um, 
we got to look at deal. this. It's, yeah, it's, 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 and it was interesting because I've seen so many people, you know, make the argument that they, they, they really want to place the blame on Dante. And mm. again, kind of like we were talking about earlier with kids and whether they should be out and all that, you know, there, there are things to say, look, this is where your negligence lies. But then there's a time to say, this is where your negligence lies. And the big thing that I always go back to in this particular situ you know, situation just like this is people say, well, you know, uh, you know, the officers, they don't know what the suspects are going to do. And I'm like, that's true. Suspects are unpredictable. But to make it a bit of a twister here, the fact that they are unpredictable is predictable. And we train officers to deal with unpredictable situations. So it's like, you're, what I look at is say, you know going in that a person that you're trying to arrest may act in some unpredictable way. So you know, you, you know, you have, if you walk into a situation, you expect that they're all just going to kind of put their hands behind their back and calmly say, you're right, officer. Um, you know, maybe not say you're right, but they might say, uh, you know, I am complying against my will. And then I would like to speak to my lawyer. Maybe they'll say that, yes. right? If you're expecting that, you know, every suspect is going to do that, you are starting off on the wrong foot because mm -hmm. we know suspects don't do that. We have plenty, plenty of evidence that a suspect will try to run. Adam Toledo tried to run. Dante Wright tried to run. Many, many other people have tried to run, right? This happens. People have this crazy notion that they're somehow going to be the one to get away from the police, even though like most people like don't. <laughs> well, also the other, there's a, there's a biological factor in this. You always count on me to start going back to biology. Sure, you sure. Know, you know, when people panic, and, you know, I'm sure you've seen this in your training, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the fight or flight, you know, you start, you get into a response, you get into a situation, um, you know, some people may take off, some people may freeze, right? They're not, there's not much thought behind that, is there? It's just, right. sometimes they even kind of snap out of it. It's like, oh, oh I was running away. Um, you know, I, I, I've had, I've heard stories from friends that have said that, you know, uh, one of the first times that they, you know, their unit or something went into combat, there'd be people who would, you know, almost kind of flinch and kind of go in the other direction before they snap right. to I was oh, okay. 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 I'm here. Stuff's real. Right. Um, you know, from, and I'm not excusing this, but knowing that human beings can react in such a way, you know, Dante may have not even thought about it. You know, he might've just, let's go get, remove myself from the situation. So right. being a, being an officer responding to that, obviously that's gotta be something you have to have a mental contingency for. It can't be unexpected to you. It right. needs to be something that you are anticipating and you're, you're already, you're already, you have to be playing chess in these situations. This is what situational awareness is about. You're supposed to be two right. to three steps ahead of whoever it is that you're engaging. Yep. So, Whenever you're there, you, they're already, they're close. They have proximity to the vehicle. The vehicle becomes a threat. You know, there's so many different things that have to be factored into it. But right. it looks to me like, you know, those types of procedural things, uh, you know, they clearly broke down and it was like they were caught off guard by the, this person, the perpetrator would want to go back in their car and evade. When right. He said it should be look at, looked at more as a normal common occurrence. There usually right. is a little bit of resistance. Right. I mean, uh, it, it's weird because the way people talk, not necessarily officers, but the way people talk when, when I interact with people online is they seem to kind of present as if, wow, this was surprising. This person ran. And I'm like, it's not surprising. It should have been expected. If I was an officer, I would kind of, uh, you know, I would think, you know, I, you know I, I've never been an officer, so I have to be careful, like, how much yeah. Monday morning quarterbacking I do. But okay. if I was an officer, I would hope that I would approach a situation and say, I need to arrest this person. They have a warrant for their arrest. They might try to run. How might they do that? Okay, they might try to drive off. All right, be prepared for that, right? And th that's it. Like, you know, you don't have to, I don't think you have to present yourself with, you know, chess-like thinking, like 
If they mm -hmm. make this move, then I'll do this and they'll do this and then this. Yeah. You know, it's you just, don't need to do all that. Just be like, all right, they might try to run on foot. They might try to take off in their car. They might try to do this. So let me just be a little bit prepared in case that happens. Then I can respond accordingly, you mm -hmm. know, whatever is the best way based on what's happening. Yes. And, and I feel like that's, I feel like that's not what happened here that he basically tried to jet and it threw them all off, you mm -hmm. know, and you, you know, she grabbed the wrong instrument in the melee and, uh, and then she ended up shooting him. And so I'm like, you're negligent for that. I'm sorry. And, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter that he's, he may be a terrible person, you know, cause some people were like, dude, I, I guess it wouldn't bother me, you know, but, he uh, he choked a woman and then tried to steal money from her, Robert, 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 money. Well, for starters, maybe that's a charge. It has not yet been proven, but even still, that's not why they pulled him over. You know, they didn't I, pull him over because somebody called in and said, this guy just tried to rob me. He's dangerous. He'll probably try to kill you. That's not what happened. So that's not that's not a reason for him to to have been shot no. on accident. No, no, it's it's absolutely not. You know, it's really it's really frustrating because um, whatever that man did before that event had it doesn't matter. You know, and right. I understand like you know they'd say, well, what if he was a murderer? Would you feel bad? You know, you murder got justice. That that's not the point. Mm -hmm. The point is we want our justice. And this is this is the very essence of, of the problem we're talking about: an unequal right. justice system. We want a justice system that if you're going, you want to have one, it needs to be consistent and needs to be equally applied. And if, right, if right. I'm going to sit here and say, you know what, I would expect the cops to treat me a certain way on this kind of right. stuff, but then dismiss it if they treat a murderer bad. I mean, it's right. It's not a it has to be dealt with then. So whatever kind of person Dante was, whatever type of person George Floyd was, none of that mattered in those moments. Right. That absolutely doesn't matter. And I really. I wish people would focus more at, at focusing on getting justice than they were right. like trying to tear people well, down. I think people need to look at it like this, right? Okay, so a woman has accused him of robbing her at gunpoint. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Yeah. But let's assume for a moment that he actually did not do that. So let's assume that he didn't do it. He ended up not going to court, and then he um, uh, was about to get arrested, freaked out, and fleed, right? Sounds very plausible for a, a person that's being accused. You know, you like people freak out. They do. Yeah, yeah. So assume all that was the case. I don't think that's. I don't think that's an assumption that's really out of line here. And then let's find out. Like, the officer shoots him. He dies. They continue their investigation, and they find out that actually the woman made it all up. She was mad at him for whatever reason, and that has happened. Um, I don't remember the particular cases. There were cases about 10 years ago. There's and, there's RPOs that uh, have led to deaths that shouldn't have been. Right. So, so there, uh, there was a couple of notable cases. Um, I want to say, and I haven't researched it, so I'm, I'm going to say it anyway just because it was a public case, but I believe the Tawana Brawley case was one of them where she was accusing some people of raping her. And yeah, I the, believe... The that was the uh, one of those North Carolina teams, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. Um, and I think something. she ended up, I think she ended up um, confessing later that she was just out and embarrassed with her own activities, and so she made up a story, right? Um, and and I may have that wrong. So, folks, if you if you're remembering the case better than me, and you're like, dude, you totally got the wrong. Okay, I, I'm getting the wrong name, but there were definitely cases, national cases, where it turned out. The young lady confessed later and said, I totally made it all up. It happens. It does Not yeah. all the time, but it does happen. So if this woman had just been upset and made up a charge against him, and then a series of events led to his death, then the argument, well, he shouldn't have committed this crime is no good. And that's the point. The point is, we can't allow negligence or we can't allow officers to shoot people that are not an immediate threat just because they may have committed an, a terrible act prior. Yeah, that, that that's is kind not of, an officer's job. No, it's kind of like a roundabout of a due process. Um, right. It is. Know. It's absolutely 
um, a, a, a way of skipping due process mm -hmm. and causes the death of somebody before they've even had a chance to mm -hmm. um, prove, I don't want to say prove their innocence because you don't really prove your innocence, but before they've had a chance to defend themselves or in some cases, like the next case that we're going to talk about, before they've even had a chance to comply. Because people want to say, well, if you just comply, like nothing will happen, right? Okay, well, how about this case? Andrew Finch, 28-year-old father of two, shot and killed by the police for simply living at the wrong address and stepping out at the wrong time. So here's what happened. Several gamers, well, this was in 2017 or 19, I believe 2017. Might have been 19. But several gamers in a couple different states were having a dispute over a dollar fifty. So gamer A threatens gamer B and says, "I'm going to call the police on you over this." Gamer B says, "You know what? Whatever. I'm not afraid of you. Go ahead and do it. You make that call. Here, here's my address." So gamer A calls the local police and he uses like Google Voice, Voice over IP, or whatever. Um, and so he makes this call to Wichita. Now none of them are living in Wichita at all right the address was from wichita but he it was a fake address that he just found on the internet so this guy calls so gamer a calls up the uh wichita police through voice over ip which made it look like he was a wichita resident and he says i just killed my father he said i've got the rest of the family held hostage and you know kind of continued on with this story you know really got them amped up of course the police uh the police respond i don't believe that there were actual swat members so I don't, I, so it was considered a swatting but i don't know that the uh i think that the police it was just regular police because i think there was an issue about whether or not um they were acting in a way that they were untrained for mm. uh but at any rate so the police are outside the door andrew hears a noise he go he opens the door to step outside and an officer uh, an officer shoots him now i believe if i'm correct not looking at my notes, but I believe the officer shot him with an AR-15. So just want to point that out there, AR-15 haters, that not every AR-15 shooting that's unjustified comes from a civilian, beside the point. So the police surrounded out his house. Andrew steps outside when he hears a noise. They immediately shot him and killed him. That's it. That's literally all the major details to this story. No lack of compliance, no stop, no get on the ground, no put your hands up. They shot him. No priors. He was just a guy that had his address pulled up by a couple guys that were squabbling on the internet, called the police, made up a wild cockamania story, and then this guy suffered from it. Mm -hmm. You know? So, like, he didn't get a chance to comply. But okay, compliance maniacs. Yeah. What about the story of Daniel Shaver? He was an exterminator on a business trip. He invited a couple buddies to his hotel room. A call came in that someone was pointing a rifle out the window. This is probably true. Why is it probably true? Because he had, uh, I'm trying to remember what type of rifle he had, but he didn't have a full scale rifle. So he had a small like BB gun type rifle, like an airsoft rifle or something like that. Uh, and he used it because he was an exterminator. He would get called out. He would go to places and shoot birds that were flying around inside of a building. You know, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And um, by the time the police showed up, one of the friends had left. So he only had one friend there. They both had been drinking. The police took in, I don't know how it exactly happened, but the police took in one of the friends unarmed or the other, the remaining friend unarmed. And at some point, Daniel was down the hall and you can look it up, you can watch the video. It's a horribly tragic video. It should bring tears to your eyes just to watch this friggin' happen, it was horrible. So okay. he's in the hallway. They at one point instruct him to get up, cross his legs, put his hands up, he does. He unfortunately reaches behind his back, spooks the officer. The officer yells at him, they, get, they tell him to get back down on the ground and to low crawl toward him. He's low crawling. They tell him, uh, no, that, that was it. They told him to low crawl. He's crying. He's begging them not to shoot him. He reaches to grab his waist or something. The officer shoots him uh, four or five times. I don't remember how many times. His, uh, his pants were falling down. Now he was sliding on the... Um, right. And he, it looked like he instinctively reached back and was grabbing his 
his belt or something and he was like trying to pull it up and he got shot right so here's a man he'd been drinking he's in full compliance in as much as you might reasonably expect somebody because let's face it people nobody really complies 100 percent why because we're not trained to be in these kind of situations. So we act a little unpredictably. We reach down, we grab our pants to pull them up. We scratch our nose, we whatever, we do whatever because we don't regularly get put in these kind of positions where an officer has us in their sights and says, you play Simon Says 100% or you're gonna get shot. This is not something that we're used to as citizens, okay? You know, but hey, maybe I'm being irrational. Maybe I'm just getting amped up for no good reason here, right? What about maybe when, you know, a citizen is, um, you know, partially complying, but not fully, but in a different way, right? Maybe, maybe this is not, maybe this is just an out of the ordinary story, right? Maybe Daniel Shaver is the exception to the rule, right? Well, just recently, Second Lieutenant, and I hope I say his name right, Caron Nazario was pulled over for lack of license plates. There's this license plate thing again. Mm -hmm. Nazario continues driving until he reached a well-lit fuel station. Now, this is something that I've heard recommended, especially for women to do, just in case they get pulled over by somebody faking being an officer, to pull over in a well-lit area. But I've also heard people say, hey, do this for the uh, safety of the officer so the officer can better see inside the car. It's better for everyone. Okay, great, this is awesome. So he pulls over, even after seeing that his temporary tags are on the back of the windows, the officers still aggressively approached Nazario and made a number of demands of him. Some of those demands were conflicting. He was told to put his hands outside the window, which he did. And then he was later told to unbuckle his car door and slowly step outside of the vehicle. And he responded at that point, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm, I'm, I'm scared to do that. And the officer barked back at him, you better be. Now, he wasn't shot, he was eventually pepper sprayed and forcefully, forcefully removed from the vehicle and then put to the ground. So I want to point out here that if a person tells you they're afraid, that's a good chance that maybe they're not the threat that you're aggressively acting they are. And mm -hmm. this goes back to my earlier point that officers need to have situational awareness. That means if the situation starts to increase, then they increase. But if it starts to de-escalate or if it starts to, you start to get the feeling like by paying attention that this person is not nearly the threat that you're acting, you don't have to lower your guard intentionally. I mean, I'm sorry, not intentionally. You, you ha don't have to lower your guard um, drastically, just enough, enough to help that situation from not getting out of control, including your own damn self. Mm -hmm. uh, that situation lit, lit me up quite a bit because even when I was watching that video and I saw him say that, I, I, I was afraid for him when they told him to put his hands, to unbuckle his, because he got his, he had right. his hands up in the window at that time. They said yeah. unbuckle the seatbelt. And also, not that this should matter, but for all of you that may not be aware of the situation, this general, this lieutenant was in his, uh, his uniform, and this is not too far away from the base that he was leaving. Um, so... Um, <clears throat> I was kind of uh, thrown off by that. They, you know, but anyways, uh, it, it was, it's a terrible video. Terrible. They, they, did they macing? Was it mace or pepper spray? They hit uh, what, whatever they carry pepper. I think, I yeah, think, you know, officers carry pepper spray. It was just, it was ridiculous. It was just absolutely right. ridiculous. And um, <clears throat> I, I'm still waiting to see what the military does to him. Cause um, you know, they were trying to say that he wasn't compliant and stuff, but you know, you watch the video, it'd be kind of hard to what he was being told to do conflicted. Right. And finally got to the point where he was like, you know, I'm afraid. Or you right. have a big man in uniform with his hands up telling you you're, he's, you're, you know, he's afraid. Uh, <laughs> you're doing something wrong. Yeah. You know, I have a story similar to that. It wasn't quite as dramatic. Um, in my 20s, in my early 20s, I'm driving to work one morning. It's about 5 a.m. Uh, we, we were we were really, really busy at the company that I worked for. And so I ended up having to go in, uh, you know, for like two or three weeks, really, really early. 
And so at like 5 or 5.30 in the morning, I'm driving to work. I get pulled over. This is in Richmond, Indiana, so a town of 40,000, right? Uh, we're not talking Chicago. We're not talking about L.A. or Oakland or some other city where, you know, who knows, maybe the guy at 5 a.m. is a crazy drug dealer, right? So yeah. none, of those, none of those garbage excuses. So I get pulled over. I am driving a Ford uh, is a Tracer. Yeah, I believe it was a Ford Tracer. So a simple four-door car. Nothing yeah. spectacular. Wasn't, wasn't anything special about it. So I get pulled over. Officer comes up. Well, back up. So the officer pulls me over. He shines, I swear to God, every single light that he had on that car right into mine. So I'm like, I can't see squat. I'm just like totally blinded. So I flip the rear view mirror enough so that I'm not blinded and I can at least see my own hands right in front of me, right? And, um, you know, because I'm trying to grab my, uh, you, you know, all, all, you know, I'm trying to prepare myself to give him, you know, my documents. So he comes up, he stops just short of the door. So just, you know, somewhere between, you know, my door, maybe halfway of the passenger door behind me. And he very gruffly says, you know, get out of the car slowly. I'm like, holy hell, what's going on here? Like I just got pulled over. So I get out and he starts yelling at me. He's like giving me a heart. I mean, he's yelling at me. He's berating me and, you yeah. know, about flipping my rear, rear view mirror. So folks, if you ever get pulled over and they shine all the lights, don't do that. The officers don't like that. So then he says this, I, I kid you not. He says, when you do that, it tells me you don't want to be blinded. <laughs> like what? <laughs> now I'm a 20 some year old guy who's used to being a smart aleck. And I'm yeah. like, I want to be like, yeah, oh, you know, I, you know, yeah, no I crap, probably... Sherlock. Yeah. yeah, no, no. Who wants to be blinded? You know, like, who has that fetish? I don't know. So anyway, then he starts questioning me. He's like, "You know why I pulled you over?" I'm like, "I, I don't. I was wearing my seatbelt. I'm driving the speed limit. I'm just going to work." By the way, I didn't know at this time not to answer questions. Okay, so I'm being a good citizen. You know, in my mind, just you know, being polite and answering the questions as he asked them. He says, "Okay, walk back. Walk with me." So we walk back behind my car. We get back about 10 feet, looks at my, points at my car. It's still running, lights are on, 5 a.m. in the morning, 5.30 a.m. in the morning. And he's like, what do you see? And I'm like, I, I'm confused. I'm like, I, I don't know. I see my car, man. I, I, what? Mm -hmm. And he said, you have a smoke-covered license plate cover, which makes it hard for me to read your license plate. That, that, that was it. That was everything. He did all of that because I had a smoke cover license plate. And because I was a young guy that thought, hey, this will be an accessory that makes my car look a little bit nicer. I bought it at Walmart. I didn't yeah. go buy it at some crazy store online or something. I bought it at Walmart, in my local town, foolishly thinking that if I could buy it, I could use it and yeah. it wouldn't be a problem. So then he gets all threatening and he's like, it better not be there the next time I see you. Mm -hmm. Like, so when people say, oh, just comply, like, this is the problem. Officers start off with this attitude like, oh, I need to be super duper aggressive. You didn't have to be aggressive. You literally could have walked up and said, hey, man, I don't know where you're going. Where are you going? And I might have said, on my way to work, man, boss making me come in early. All right. I just want to let you know, you got a license plate cover on. Probably bought that from the local Walmart, or Meyer, or whatever. But uh, I just want to let you know that uh, according to city ordinance, I got to be able to read your license plate. I can't read it. I'm going to be cool with you just to let you know. If you're going to want to take that off, sorry you spent money on it. Mm -hmm. Like that's all he had to say. This kind of action would have been so much better over a stupid license plate. Now, I had no warrants. Whatever he ran, I know he didn't find anything because yeah. I don't have any warrants, you know, so there was no reason to approach the vehicle that way. And, and you know, folks, I want to tell you something. I went to, it was in 2017, I think it was 2017, the local Jacksonville Police Department held this thing called Coffee with a Cop. I had an opportunity, I had some availability that morning, so I went. I went down to the local coffee shop. There were a couple officers there. They had bought some donuts. <laughs> donuts. They bought some donuts and coffee and they were offering to people. 
And so I would sit down and I'm talking with them. And one of the things that came up was these kind of situations. And they said, you know, it's very frustrating because citizens want to pull out their phones. You know, I don't have my phone. They want to pull out their phones all the time and just record us all over the place. And I'm like, okay. And they're like, you know, we just want citizens to remember that most interactions with the police um, don't end up in a firefight or don't end up in arrest. It's just, it's very simple. We might write you a ticket. Maybe we let you off with a warning, but no confrontation, you know, happens at all. And I'm like, okay, fair enough. Will you remember that when you pull somebody over and you walk up and you're talking aggressively to them for no good friggin' reason? And the officer said, oh, 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 we, um, we, we never know what we're walking into. Oh, okay. Well, Adam Toledo didn't know it, that he was going to be walking into a guy that was going to yell and tell him to stop and then shoot him the moment he did anyway. Dante Wright didn't know that he was walking into an officer that couldn't tell a taser from a gun, right? So citizens don't know what we're walking into either. So I took exception to this because I'm like, you're asking me, the untrained citizen, to behave in a way that you're not willing to reciprocate, who happens to be the trained person. Like, that's unacceptable to me. I'm sorry. And this yeah. is why I hold cops, officers, to a much higher standard. Because I am not, I mean, I'm sort of trained somewhat, not, not a lot, but I got a little bit of training. I got more than, say, my wife. My wife doesn't have the level of training that I have, you know. Um, and if something spooks her, she may do something that, 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 that she shouldn't do. I don't know. Hopefully she wouldn't, but I can't guarantee it because that's what it means to be untrained. Yeah, I completely agree. And like each, every case we've talked about for the most part has included some elements that training could possibly address. Right. So I do hope some of the, the discussion in some of these political circles actually really emphasize that, you know, not just platitudes, you know what I mean? Not just right. Because those don't actually help people. Um, you know, it's just a, it's just a, it's just a shame that we've got. It's just, it does seem like this stuff happens too often. And I know the media covers a lot, and I'm glad that they do. But it just seems like every time um, this happens, you'll have a few people who will talk about the type of solutions, like the honest solutions, like you and right. I are sort of talking about. We're trying to look at because we, we can agree we don't want this to happen. Right. Um. And we're sitting here talking about, but it seems like it keeps getting sidetracked. It's like, okay, just defunding the police is the way to go, or this is the way to go. They're not actually talking about any of the roots of these problems. Right. It's a shame. And, and it seems like I might be unfair to police. I'm picking out some, you know, national stories, but the, here's the thing. These stories are happening all across the U S and mm -hmm. I look at them and I say, there's a somewhat connection because the aggressive posturing that the officer did uh, at when he pulled me over for no useful reason was it was unnecessary but what happens is it becomes normalized it becomes like okay this is normal like that officer told me when i went and had you know coffee with an with coffee with a cop he told me he said well we don't know what we're walking into so we got to be on alert we got to be amped up and charged and ready to fight Right. So what ends up happening is for a simple traffic stop, I'm supposed to remember that, hey, most of these things, you know, end up pretty peaceful. The officer doesn't have to remember that. So they can come up really, really aggressive. Well, when that becomes the norm for pulling somebody over for a speeding ticket, then I believe what ends up happening is that sets a baseline for more aggressive behavior in different incidents. Yep. So, for instance, I have another story here. That's the story, the case of Kelly Thomas, a schizophrenic homeless man in Fullerton, California. This was in 2011. Kelly was beaten so badly by police that they broke his facial bones. Then they left him in a pool of his own blood. And then when emergency personnel showed up, they demanded that the emergency personnel tend to police first, who suffered no serious injuries. Kelly went into a coma while in the hospital, and then life support was pulled five days later. Video later surfaced, which had this conversation between the officer and Kelly. 
I warn you people, if you have children present, because this is generally a, a clean show, um, there's some profanity here coming up. So do what, do what you feel is appropriate. So here's, what, here's that conversation. Now you see my fist, Officer Manuel Ramos asked Thomas while slipping on a pair of latex gloves. Yeah, what about them? Thomas responded. They are getting ready to fuck you up, said Ramos. To which Thomas replied, start punching, dude. Now I want to ask yourself, is that the police, is that the kind of policing that you want? Because it seems to become more and more prevalent. It's 2021. We've been having riots over policing as early as 1965 when the Watts riots broke out. Now you might argue that that particular scenario was caused uh, you know, unnecessarily because I think if you look at the details of the story, the people that were pulled over, it was a black family. They got pulled over. I think one person did kind of assault a police officer. And then there was a rumor, I believe, that um, that the police officer kicked a pregnant woman or something like that. And that kicked off a whole bunch of things. So I can understand if there's some details there that maybe got mixed in or what have you. But think think of it this way. People threw a fit. They, they rioted because of how they felt that the police were interacting with citizens. Now, if you've got a good reputation of being somebody that never would hurt a fly, everybody that knows you, everybody that knows anything about you, usually jumps to your defense. But if you have a reputation for being aggressive and aggressive, aggressive posturing, then when a story like that pops up, it's much more easily believed. So think of it in terms like this, people. Imagine that somebody says, this firefighter pushed a pregnant woman into the fire. We would be like, what? No way. Everybody would be skeptical. Why? Yeah. Because we don't believe that firefighters would behave like that. Because we have not seen them behave like that on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. We see them behave the exact opposite. So if a story yeah. like that popped up, Seems we probably wouldn't riot r right away. No, no, it, it, the response would be a lot different. But your your analogy is is kind of spot on. And that that gentleman, um, uh, Mr. Kelly, he was. Um, there's no other way to put it. I mean, the man was beat to death. Uh, you know, it, it's there's really hard to take any like how, how do we improve. Like from that, it's just, that's just a bad person. Right. You, you know, it's like three officers, I think. Yeah. I mean, it's like, they're just like, it, sometimes they're, it's a fault because of the structure of the job, or maybe right. it's a fault because of the structure of a training or maybe human error, whatever. In this case, just like any other profession, you've got people who are just, and I'm trying to not use language here. Um, you know, not they're, that I haven't already. Yeah, they're 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 they're, e they're evil people. Okay, so right. and then unfortunately, in all positions of power, sometimes they're teachers, sometimes they're doctors, sometimes right. they're lawyers. Uh, but you get somebody that's in a position of power who abuses that. So I I, I to be honest, because I want to be honest here, I, I certainly do not think that uh, there's a mass problem of cops beating people in the back rooms. Uh, after they put, you know, I, I, I don't think things are happening like that in mass. I think this is just right. uh, probably something, if, if anything, I could take from this case moving forward, other than those, those people uh, seeing some justice um, uh, who did that is maybe the vetting process. Right. Uh, you know, when you go into the military, uh, particularly if you go uh, advance up ranks and things, you, you have a lot of psychological testing, mm -hmm. uh, try to weed out people for, for various things, perhaps maybe, uh, entrance into law enforcement maybe 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 some of that could be looked at right uh, other than that well I mean, a number of these officers uh, you know some of the officers that we've talked about uh, have complaints against them for excessive force see, see that's the thing too like and, and i'm not well, trying to prior make this, to these events i'm not trying to make this episode of bigger con scope on what we're already going but we we have mentioned several times that this problem is a complex one right mm -hmm. so just how much do the police unions have to do with keeping bad cops on board? Right. 
I mean, that's a tremendous problem, but it's political suicide. Yep. Uh, you know, it's political suicide. But, you know, we really have to talk about this. Chauvin wouldn't have been back on the force if it wasn't for the union. Right. He had problems early in his career. And, you know, and uh, I mean, several, I mean, you see it like about half of the ones that you see that are engaged in the, 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 the public um uh, events that we've been seeing about half of them at least they've had prior uh, questionable engagements right a lot of times they're just brought back in so like the accountability factor really is a problem and uh, it needs to be addressed and one way to do it is like the police unions the power the police unions have over uh the acceptable level of conduct that they can they can do is pretty pretty bad it's pretty bad yeah we as citizens even if you don't have any training in policing matters of any kind whatsoever whether it's military or regular uh, civilian policing here in the United States, it doesn't matter. We need to look at it and say, these are not the results that we want, period. Well, can I add something to you? Absolutely. You know, um, we talked, earlier, you mentioned earlier about, you know, appealing to authority and things, and we talked about that. You know, that's, that's important. Don't get me wrong. Nothing does substitute for training and for people who do that, but that doesn't mean that we can't have people who don't do that directly can't have a voice in it. Right. Um, it's a separate profession. But still, one one could easily argue that there, there is actually more safety quality checks in pharmacy than there are just about any other profession, right? Mm -hmm. We've got safeguard after safeguard. Well, on our, our boards, this is one thing they do right. Like the Board of Pharmacy here in Florida, they're not all pharmacists. There's one person who's a, a, just a, a, has nothing to do with pharmacy whatsoever. It's called a, it's a community position. Mm -hmm. And what that does is that adds outside accountability to the board of yep. pharmacy from outside of our profession. Right. You know, and let me tell you, sometimes it's, it's a pain in the butt. Well, the board in general is a pain in the butt, but let me, let me not go there, but you know, that brings a level of accountability that you don't otherwise have. You have right. none of that with the police force. With right. these, you, you have, have no independent outside account. So basically they investigate themselves and they clear themselves. Yeah. That's how it goes. So, yeah, sorry. I'm I'm off my little. I just I just wanted to no, share. No, it's good. I mean, we're other, we're, other yeah. professions who deal with, I mean, serious things, but less direct contact with the population does have uh, some citizen accountability. The medical board does the same thing. Uh, you know, there's there's a citizen representative who's not a physician who works on right. the board, who who suffices as being an oversight for the general public to make sure that the board of medicine or the board of pharmacy is not doing things that are outside of their scope and yeah, obviously was, it's, uh, it's not perfect right but right. you know it, it's something you know there was something i read a while back probably six months a year ago and it was something along that very line where there was a particular profession and they had people that had nothing to do with the profession who got involved and they were offering things they were like hey what about this and what ends up happening once you're in, and everybody should recognize this, once you're in a career for a long time, you start overlooking some of the simple things. And sometimes it's those simple things that need to be rechallenged from time to time. And sometimes it's, you know, it's what we call, and everybody's probably heard this phrase, a fresh set of eyes. Mm -hmm. Basically somebody who hasn't been staring at the same thing so long that they ignore some of the extraneous detail that might actually be important, right? You get somebody, you know, this is one of the reasons why young minds that get into a new field are making great changes because they come in and they, they have a brand new perspective on the environment as it currently is. And the people that have been there for 30 years, they're not coming to it with a fresh mind as it currently is. They're in it as an experienced mind as it's been growing and changing and, and, and whatnot. So they have a different outlook on it. So I think you're right. This is a very, this, this would be very, very valuable to have, like say a citizen review board and say, look, citizens, we want a new citizen in once every, you know, I don't know, once a year, right? Some, we'll just make something up for the time being. But just imagine that like a, each, each police department said, we're gonna bring in like two citizens to review you know, if, you know, things, whatever, you know, just shootings, yeah. you know, interactions with, with citizens, whatever. And um, 
once a year, we're going to switch it up. We're going to, we're going to cycle out and we're going to get new people in that are fresh, brand new. They haven't had any experience so that we always have a fresh set of eyes. That would go a long way, I think, to yeah, I, I think know, so too. point out stuff. I mean, any government agency, in my opinion, should be transparent, you know, especially since they do exist. And that's just one thing I see, particularly my profession does, that, that there's definitely some benefit to it. And what you said about, you know, um, I kind of look at it as like an extension of the gorilla test, right? You become ingrained to your environment. And this is just right. biology. It moves out of your working memory and it, you kind of go on autopilot, right? It's kind of like your drive to work, your, your commute to work every day. I always like to use this example. Most people really aren't paying attention to all the houses they pass, right? Right. So one day, just randomly, they could tear out one of the houses and an elephant could be standing there. Most people are going to drive right by and miss it because they're on, they're on a form of autopilot. Right. They're not really consciously taking in each little thing because it's something they've become accustomed to. Right. Well, professionals are that way. And, I, and I, to an extent, I'm worried that uh, Officer Potter was her name. Yep. Potter, I, I'm afraid to an extent her experience is what led to her, um, that mistake, that grave mistake of grabbing right. a taser first. Perhaps maybe she became so... Uh, uh, just, oh, I've been doing this forever. I don't need to go to the range five, you know, three days a week or three days a month or something. Right. You, you never know how much that can come in. So whenever you have somebody with fresh eyes coming in and looking at something, um, you know, it's often, often they discover things that you didn't see. And sometimes they're useful and sometimes they're not. Right. But uh, in the case with, uh, with policing and the kind of impact that that has on our society, I think every little bit helps, especially if it has to do with involving the public more. So I want to point this out, folks, before we wrap this up. I am not anti-police. No. I do think that there are a lot of things that need to happen because um, we're having results that people aren't happy with. When people aren't happy with results, you figure out what you can do to change it. I get it. You need to enforce laws. Right. That's your job. That's what you've signed up to do. But I think that if you're a police officer and you're watching, one of the things that you should really do, what you should be really critical about is say, are all of these laws useful for me to actually be enforcing? Is this, you know, is this particular law something that I really want to use my level of force? The fact that I am walking up with a gun in hand, maybe not in hand physically, but I have a gun and I can use it if I absolutely have to. Is that law something that you feel warrants that level of, um, force. of, of force of threat, right? The, the either force or threat of force. Yeah. And if it's not, then start questioning those things. Start looking at it. You know, if you're an officer, you need to look at it and say, okay, uh, there's a large percentage of the population that are really upset with me and it's not just black people. Okay. Like everybody criticizes the libertarian party for being like mostly white males. Well, guess what? Most of the libertarian party is upset with the current state of policing. Mm -hmm. And that's to put it lightly for some of us. Yeah. Okay. So there are plenty of people who are not uh, who are not black Americans. So we're not just, it's, it's not an issue of, oh, those black people just don't understand. No, that's not it. There are plenty of non-black people, plenty of white people that have a problem with the policing. Plenty of us who have never had the worst, the negative experiences that some black Americans have. And we're looking at this and we're like, this has to change. Hey, let me, let me, let me add this. To get on board with this. No, I, let me let me add to that. You know, I, I don't want to break everybody up. I, I don't I don't like that. Right. When everybody first saw George Floyd, what happened? America was on board with that. They, they, that's not right. So, look, at the end of the day, we're not really a whole lot different. I don't care what your political background was, right. what your race or ethnicity, any of that stuff. Ninety nine point nine percent of the people who watched that video, we all felt the same sickening feel. OK, mm -hmm. now I, I hate that we have to always unify around bad things, right? But look, one thing that people get um, so confused with today's political climate is we could be so 
critical of law enforcement as libertarians uh, of the law and of its enforcement mm -hmm. um that it does make us seem like at times that we're anti-police we're anti those people let me say if we're going to build a police system in a libertarian society these people that are are willing to put on the badge and are willing to engage in these dangerous uh, and it, they are dangerous jobs we're going to need these people so right. the way I, well, I look at it is I criticize public education all the time. I just actually tonight, my interview with Arvind Bohr is going to be on. Uh, obviously, he's a big proponent of abolishing public education. But I want to attack public education, but I'm not attacking the teachers. I'll need the teach. We need the teachers, the, their right. skills. And we need them to be as best as they can be because right. it's our community. Right. So right. I, I don't want teachers to think I, I'm attacking them. We need their help to make education better right the same thing is with the cops individual cops we need them to help us make this institution they work for better right so it's I, I want to make sure that we're focused on look we don't they're not we're not antagonistic to you we live in the same communities as you several of my neighbors are law enforcement officers you know we live in the same community so me me or libertarians attacking the institution you know, we're not, it's not the people let's, let's right. get them on board. Let's get them to feel more comfortable with being around the community, with doing ride alongs, with being more friendly upon approach. Right. You know, cause you know, the devil's advocate side of this is, you know, could you, I mean, it is scary for a lot of these police officers right now. Some of them are quite frankly, are getting assassinated. So this is a complex situation. It is. So, you know, we're, but we're not going to get over these humps. We're not going to get over all these barriers until we actually start having meaningful conversation. Right. And if you're a police officer and you're watching, I encourage you to think about the things that I've said. One of the things that I pointed out was like, hey, you know what? Civilians, citizens, I don't like to use the word civilians, um, citizens, they need to mentor more. They need to help out because there are certain situations that might be avoided, you know, but at the end of the day, I'm looking at each situation based on the events that are happening currently in that particular situation. So if you chase somebody, if you're an officer and you chase somebody, you yell, stop, 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 stop. And they finally stop and then they turn around, they put their hands up. I'm expecting you to stop as well and not shoot them, right? That is separate from the fact that maybe this 13 year old should not have been out. That's its own issue, completely separate. All right. So that, you know, and I think that officers need to get out there and say, look, you know what? We got a ton of laws that we're trying to enforce and we really don't want to shoot all you citizens. It's really not what we're looking for. Please work with each other so that you don't even have to call us yeah. this situation. I pointed back to me like it was, you know, this is, you know, I'm facing, I'm facing the, uh, uh, the Bahamas. Okay. So when I point, I'm pointing up. You know, north okay. to, the, to the Yanks. Oh, um, hey, the situation that's, that's funny. That's, that, you know, that's funny because we're facing each other. Right, you're, right. You're in, I'm facing north. Yeah. You're in Jacksonville. <laughs> right, I'm right. A couple hours south. So you have to point forward. I have to point back. You know, but but up north of me in what was it, Columbus, I believe. Uh, you know, you had this this young 16 year old girl who got shot recently, right? And and I support that shooting. Like I like I've been critical of the police, but this one I looked at. I've watched several different videos. I've watched them in slow mode. I'm like, look, unfortunately, this was justified yeah. because you start stabbing somebody while you're in the presence of police. Bam. End of story. So police, if you're out there, say, look, we need people to get out there and mentor. So hopefully this, you know, a young 16 year old girl won't take it to the extreme of trying to stab somebody that she's angry with. And yeah. then I won't be put in the position where I have to make a life or death call at the last moment. Yeah. Right? Like this is what the police need to be doing. They need to get out there and say, look, citizens, you've got to help us. You've got to intervene be long before we get there. You've got to make sure that the 20 some year old guy and his girlfriend don't neglect their baby so that their baby dies of malnutrition you need to get in there long before that happens because by the time these events happen it's too late you need to intervene early yep. now with that right. i'm going to close this out i'm going to do something entirely different we're not having a bill review today people what we're doing is i'm going to read 
the last words of Elijah McClain. Now, if you don't know who Elijah McClain is, in August of 2019, Elijah McClain, a 23-year-old black massage therapist, was walking home when he was confronted by the police. Now, I watched a good portion of the body cam footage on YouTube, and I read a number of sources. It seems like he was an awkward young man. Yeah. The wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, from the best I can tell, he actually did not commit any crime whatsoever. The body cam footage recorded his last words. I, to before, honor. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, uh, are we? Can can we close with that? Yeah, um, I'm closing with that. I'm gonna wrap. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I, tell I will, well, no, well, big, not because I'm trying to rush you on that, because I, I just want the listeners to to notice. I, I was aware of this this uh, young man, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I hadn't looked into the words that he had said. Um, and when I listened to your episode Monday, uh, from Monday to Yale, um, and I got to the part where you read it and you read it dramatically and, uh, you know, wow. You know, so I want everybody to listen to the words that this, this young man says, and I, I don't want you to put any presuppositions or anything in there. I just want you to think, is this the best we can do? Right. Just, just ask yourself that, is that the best we can do? And if the answer is no, we can do better then the next conversation you have with someone about police reform or whether if it's being a mentor in your community, you remember that. That's the that's not the best we can do. Well, if that's not the best we can do, then you're the one that needs to prove it. We need to prove it to each other in our communities. We need to do it. Yep. You know, yep. it's, it's not anybody else's responsibility to, to, to handle how we conduct ourselves and those around us. So listen to this young man's words. Yep. It's gonna, now, I, I, will, I will give you a fair warning, folks. It is a bit dramatized on purpose. But what I want you to do is I want you to consider as you're listening that this might be your son or daughter's last words. I can't breathe. I have my ID right here. My name is Elijah McLean. That's my house. I was, I was just going home. I'm an introvert. I'm just different. That's all. I'm so sorry. I have no gun. I don't do that stuff. I don't do any fighting. Why are you attacking me? I don't even kill flies. I don't eat meat. But I, I don't judge people. I don't judge people who do eat meat. Forgive me. All I was trying to do was become better. I will do it. I will do anything. Sacrifice my identity. I'll do it. You are all phenomenal. You are beautiful, and I love you. Try to forgive me. I'm a mood Gemini. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Ow, that really hurt. You are all very strong. Teamwork makes the dream work. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to do that. I just can't breathe correctly. <laughs>